Hi, I'm back and we're going to talk about vitamin K2 and something called pathological calcification. Okay, now what is pathological calcification? This is a condition in your body where calcium is developing in the wrong places. It's usually involved in placking in the arteries. It could also be the calcification of part of your stomach, kidney, as in kidney stones, or even calcification in polycystic kidney disease. Uh, it could also be calcification in your lungs. Uh, there's calcification in the breast tissue, uh, calcification of the cornea, of the eye. So it's calcium deposits involved in certain diseased states. Now there's a lot more to know about this condition, but I just wanted to give you some of the basics. So we have this calcium that is developing in the soft tissues of the body, not in the bone. This calcium could be developing as a need to act like a Band-Aid because there's oxidation in the vascular system or a certain part of the body. And let's say you don't have enough vitamin E to protect that oxidative lesion or selenium, which is a very powerful antioxidant involved with glutathione, which is the main antioxidant of the liver. Then you have the added ischemia, which is a lack of blood flow. That combination of low nutrients, uh, damage to the tissues, low blood flow, calcium will tend to invade and start to actually heal the area at the expense of clogging an artery. Now, the other interesting thing about this is calcium will tend to accumulate in certain parts of the body involving the control of pH, like the kidneys, like the stomach. So the stomach makes hydrochloric acid. And if you're not making enough hydrochloric acid and that stomach tissue becomes a little too alkaline, you'll have calcium deposits because of that. Then you have nanobacteria, which is the smallest known bacteria. They're very tiny. And you have these little microbes that hide in these little calcium shells or little igloos to protect themselves as a survival mechanism. Almost impossible to kill with antibiotics. And they're involved in so many diseases that have calcification connected to it, like periodontal disease or calcification in the arteries or even kidney stones, sometimes gallstones. And just as a side note, if you suspect nanobacteria, because you have calcification in any of these locations, uh, I would recommend taking fulvic acid and something called EDTA. This is the natural chelator. Now, let me just shift gears to vitamin K2. Vitamin K1 has everything to do with clotting, okay, preventing bleeding. Vitamin K2 is completely different. It's involved in about 17 different proteins involving the movement of calcium out of the soft tissue back into the bone, out of the soft tissue, into the teeth, for example. Now, there are other functions too. For example, one being involved in uh, the mitochondria. And this is one of the reasons why if they have enough vitamin K2, they have a lot of energy. I personally notice when I take vitamin K2, uh, I'm much stronger when I work out. So it has a lot to do with building up the mitochondria, especially with skeletal muscle and providing endurance. So vitamin K2 has about stopping some type of bleeding going on in the body. Vitamin K2 is the transportation of calcium. And then comes up the question, is vitamin K2 a common vitamin deficiency? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Many people are deficient in vitamin K2. And it could be for various reasons, but vitamin K2 is in organ meats, it's in egg yolks, it's in butter, it's in hard cheeses, uh, it's in goose liver, so if you're in a low-fat diet, you may be deficient. Now, it's also in fermented uh, soybeans, for example. There's a product called NATO. But in America, very few people consume fermented soybeans as NATO. Uh, unless you live in Japan, you're probably not going to consume that on a regular basis. But if you did, you would get vitamin K2. Now, you could take it from a supplement and get vitamin K2 very easily. But I just wanted to point out, uh, it was discovered in 1994 that if you're deficient, the body will convert to vitamin K2. And in 1998, it was discovered that vitamin K1 could convert to vitamin K2 without the bacteria, like in your flora, because your microbes make vitamins, uh, definitely vitamin K1. But even without this bacteria, you can actually make some K2. Now, here's the problem. What if you're also deficient in vitamin K1? 
what are the common vitamin K1 foods? The leafy greens. So for those people who don't consume enough greens or foods that have K2, they're gonna be deficient. Now, I also wanna mention that antibiotics will deplete vitamin K2. A low-fat diet could be the reason why you have low vitamin K2. Of course, if you're not consuming the fermented uh, soy uh, NATO. If you're on statins, that could be the reason why you have low vitamin K2. Uh, mineral oil will deplete vitamin K2. GI tract issues, irritable bowel syndrome, celiac, can cause malabsorption and lower your K2. And if you have liver damage, let's say you have a fatty liver, that could also be the reason why you have low vitamin K2. And there's another important point that's quite interesting. Professor Bruce Ames uh, developed something called the triage theory. And that theory goes like this. If you have a subclinical vitamin deficiency, and let's say you have some of the vitamin, but you don't have the full required amount, the body will then ration out what it has only for those actions involving short-term survival, and it will not allocate that nutrient for all of the functions that don't involve short-term survival. So when we talk about vitamin K1, and let's say you had uh, a subclinical deficiency of vitamin K1, which means you didn't have enough of it, the body's gonna allocate that to coagulation first which is gonna involve the stopping of any type of broken blood vessels or bleeding internally before any is allocated to the calcium removal. And I really think this right here is the reason why so many people have calcium building up in the wrong place, simply because they either don't have enough vitamin K1 to convert to K2, or they're not consuming enough of the K2, or they're on antibiotics, or they might be in statins, or they have digestive issues, or a fatty liver. Those are the more common reasons why we have this problem. It can also be a low vitamin E, combined with adding a lot of sugar to your diet and high carbs, which create the oxidation in the first place, which then can even make you susceptible to certain types of bacteria, which make things worse. So in summary, if you have calcification, what you need to do is take some of this, some of this right here. Make sure you start taking vitamin K2 because if you're trying to get this from food, probably is not gonna be enough. You wanna take larger quantities to start actually reversing some of this damage right here. And I would definitely start beefing up, no pun intended, vitamin K1 by consuming more leafy greens. And if you don't have any symptoms of any type of calcium buildup, as a preventative measure, I would do healthy keto, which is large amounts of greens, healthy fats to get your K2, and you're gonna to be totally bulletproofed. Thanks for watching. So if you want more knowledge on how to create a healthy body, subscribe now and get daily notifications.